Hi, welcome to Angie B's house. I'm Angie B, and ever since I started my YouTube channel, or decided to start a YouTube channel, uh, I did want to make the premise of the channel to be about how I do things, hopefully teach new skills, but also provide kind of like a diary of uh, what uh, you know I'm going through um, as far as my health. Now the reason I wanted to include uh, a diary of my health is because it's such a big part of who I am and what I do today. This part of my journey in life began April 3rd, 2009. I was only age 43 and that is when I was diagnosed with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, just like many other patients who have been diagnosed with this disease and form of cancer, it was found quite by accident. Now, I'm not including this to evoke sympathy from anyone uh, or to for anyone to feel sorry for me. Uh, it's just uh, I want to be able to help others who you know experience many of the same things that I do and my big part of my experience right now is dealing with this disease. So uh, as I said it was found quite by accident just like most people who have the chronic lymphocytic leukemia or even other kinds of cancers. Um, I was visiting my doctor because I was experiencing uh, a lot of fatigue and we couldn't quite figure out what it was so she did a complete blood count and a complete metabolic profile. Uh, that was done on March 31st, 2009. So the next day uh, I received a call from her saying that she wanted to see me in the office on Friday, April, August, April 3rd, uh, but also either the 1st or the 2nd of April, I needed to go ahead and get a chest x-ray. That's, you know, when I went into her office, that's when she told me my husband the diagnosis. And of course, when you hear that word, cancer, it's scary. It's very scary. Uh, the Lord does work in mysterious ways, though, because that same day, after the appointment, after I found out, uh, I was sitting in Walmart's parking lot crying because I was so upset. And one of my neighbors, who I knew had been fighting leukemia himself, showed up out of the blue to say hello. And so it was very encouraging because he won his fight with leukemia. And it did give me some hope that I didn't have when I first started or first got diagnosed. Well, um, I'm happy to report at that point though, the fatigue was actually being caused by taking allergy medicine every day. So as soon as I quit that, much of the fatigue I was experiencing did disappear. Uh, but um, later, or a couple months later is when I did uh, visit the oncologist for the first time and he was very skeptic skeptical because of my age that I even had the disease. But he went ahead and did, uh, you know, the blood count and the metabolic profile again. He also did perform a PET scan and a bone marrow biopsy. And, you know, maybe in a future video I'll share what it was like going through one of those. However, unfortunately, after doing the testing, he did confirm the diagnosis. Uh, I was offered a clinical trial at that time to begin treatment right away, uh, but I chose the standard option of treatment for chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and that is the wait and see protocol. Okay, so you might ask, what is chronic lymphocytic leukemia? Well, it is a form of cancer. I'm going to be reading this off of an article that I printed from the Cancer, American Cancer Society's website, cancer.org. I'll put a link to the article in, my, in the comment section of my video. And uh, 
but it does you know give a little bit of information so I thought I'd share that with you uh, as you probably know cancer start uh, when cells in the body begin to grow out of control um, and cells in nearly any part of the body can uh, become cancerous and spread to other areas of the body what chronic lymphocytic leukemia is, it's a type of cancer that starts from cells that become the white blood cells called lymphocytes. And it starts in the bone marrow, which is why I did have the bone marrow biopsy. Um, the leukemia cells start in the bone marrow, but then go into the blood, which is why it's also called the blood cancer. When one of these cells changes and becomes a leukemia cell, it no longer matures normally. Often it will divide to make new cells faster than normal and they also don't die when they should. This allows them to build up in the bone marrow, crowding out normal cells, and at some point these cells leave the bone marrow and spill into the bloodstream. And it does often cause the number of white blood cells in the blood to increase. When I first got diagnosed, my white blood cell count was hovering around 24, 25,000 when normal is under 9,000. But I wasn't having a lot of symptoms at that time, so that's why we decided to stay on the wait and see protocol. Now, once in the blood, leukemia cells can spread to other organs uh, where they can prevent other cells in the body from functioning normally. So it can spread, the reason I had the PET scan is because it can spread to like the pancreas, the liver, the kidneys, the gallbladder, you know, pretty much any of your organs it can spread to. And so that's why they do the CAT scan is to make sure that none of those are affected from the cancer. And at that point, it wasn't. I, I was fine. Everything was, was good. Um, now, how leukemia is different from other types of cancer is that other types start in organs like the lungs, the colon, the breast, and then spread to the bone marrow. Well, cancer that starts elsewhere and then spreads to the mo mo bone marrow, of course, aren't leukemia. So it, leukemia is kind of opposite of other cancers where you know it starts in the bone marrow, spreads to other parts of the body. There, you know, not all leukemias are the same and knowing the specific type does help doctors treat you better. When it's acute, it means that it's very fast growing. It's something that happens very quickly, uh, very abruptly. Chronic means that it is very slow growing, um, progresses over time, and just, you know, just like any kind of health condition that can be acute or chronic. You know, it just when it's chronic, it just lasts a lot longer. So you know, just it depends whether it's acute or chronic. Depends on whether most of the abnormal cells are immature and more like stem cells, or mature and more like normal white blood cells. In chronic leukemia, the cells can mature partly, but not completely, and they may look fairly normal, but of course they're not. They generally do not fight infection as well as normal white blood cells do, and they survive longer than normal cells. They build out, crowd out the normal cells, and then take a long time before they cause problems. Most people can live for many years, but chronic leukemias are generally harder to cure than acute leukemia. I think that's the highlights as far as what chronic lymphocytic leukemia is. Um, there's two kinds of lymph chronic lymphocytic leukemia, also known as CLL. So if you see cell CLL, that's what it is. Uh, one kind of cell grows very slowly, so it may take a long time before the patient needs treatment, which was kind of like what I had. Um, there are chronic forms that do grow faster, making the disease more serious, but it's still chronic and very difficult to cure or you know put into remission and then the lab tests that they do um, one of the other tests that I had is called a fish study and flow cytometry and it basically watches the cells to see how they develop and that lets the uh, doctor know 
how serious or what kind of chronic lymphocytic leukemia that I ha that you have. Uh, as I mentioned, they, they did offer me treatment right away and I declined. I went on the wait and see. Doctor said typically um, once diagnosis is made, it's approximately six to ten years from diagnosis before treatment is needed. I was diagnosed in April of 2009 I began treatment March of 2015, so not quite six years. And I probably could have or should have started treatment the fall of 2014, but I wanted to make sure I got through Christmas and the holidays uh, before I did. At that time when I decided on treatment, I did make the decision to join a clinical trial. Uh, the clinical trial is set up to determine what or what its goal is to try and approve, get my, the medication that I'm taking approved for first line, front line treatment. Um, without the clinical trial, I would have gone with traditional chemotherapy, which unfortunately is not always very effective with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And most individuals who have traditional frontline uh, chemotherapy, you know, might go into some remission, get the disease controlled, and then it comes back. And then they have to have another form of treatment. So the medicine that I'm taking is called Imbruvica. Uh, generic form is Ibrutinib. And um, the clinical trial it was com is comparing that treatment for first time treatment to traditional, um, it's called FCR, I apologize, I don't know exactly what those letters stand for. Um, I can, you know, put a link to that in my comment section. And uh, I was randomized, could have had the traditional treatment, but I was, as a doctor say, fortunate enough to get the abrutinib arm of the study. Uh, there are also, of course, other things that they are studying with the clinical trial, um, you know, like efficacy and toxicity and finding out, you know, what is perhaps the best dosage for the average person. And um, I did begin that in the first part of March of 2015. Uh, I started with three capsules a day. I took that for 28 days. After the 28, first, first 28 days, uh, I did remain on a 28-day cycle, but I also began getting infusion of rituxan every 28 days for six. Okay, so every, as I was saying, every 28 days after the first 28 for six months, an additional six months, I did also receive an infusion of a drug called rituxan. One thing that is good about having waited uh, for treatment is that with the rituxan they did find that a lot of people have a severe allergic reaction. So prior to receiving that drug, uh, I did also receive 50 milligrams of Benadryl. Uh, I was also placed on an antiviral, an antibiotic, and a um, medicine to help with uric acid because one of the side effects of the rituxan is a buildup of uric acid and I took those until about two months after my last rituxan infusion. Now one thing that I did um, experience with the rituxan is um, I also did see an increase in my reverse T3 on my thyroid, um, which of course is probably going to be a subject of another video. Um, but uh, during treatment, uh, I did want to, you know, go over some of the, the side effects that I began experiencing. Um, at this point, my blood, white blood cell count was up to uh, 84 to 85,000. So while the doctor said that a number doesn't necessarily mean treatment was necessary, uh, because I was also having night sweats, frequent infect, upper respiratory infections, as well as uh, increased fatigue uh, that was the indication that yes I needed to begin treatment so during treatment 
the side effects that I had were, and I apologize if this is too much information, but again, I wanted to share this because a lot of what I experienced was not shared with me from, by my doctor until I started to experience them. So I'm hoping that this might help someone else who is potentially going to go through treatment. Uh, but the uh, side effects that I had were uncontrollable diarrhea. So in addition to the medicines I already mentioned, I also had to take uh, an antidiarrheal. I had extreme nausea. Now the nausea didn't start until about the third month, but it was so bad I was on three different anti-nausea medicines. I had the Zofran that I took every eight hours, and then a second medicine that I took four hours after the Zofran that would fit so I'd have something every four hours. And then I also had the patch behind my ear. Uh, you typically will get that patch when uh, you, you, you have surgery, if you have you know problems with anesthesia. Also helps with motion sickness. But with the three, I still had nausea, but at least I, it, it wasn't, it was tolerable. Um, I had um, a loss of appetite somewhat. Um, there were days when I would be starving hungry. And I've heard this experience with many types of chemotherapy. Um, extremely hungry, decide something sounds really good, go get it, take a couple bites and say, nope, I'm done. <laughs> And um, other thing is I had chills. When I say chills, this was the middle of July and August. And in here in Illinois, it's very humid and can get, you know, in excess of 95 to 100 degrees, some days over 100 degrees. Yes, I had air conditioning on. But the air conditioning is, my house is typically set around 73, 74 degrees. So even going outside felt really good to me because I had chills so bad. Um, I would be in bed not feeling well with the nausea and, and the, I'll talk about some pain I was having in a minute. But um, I had my winter pajamas on, a sheet, a blanket, a comforter, and an electric throw turned all the way up. If I removed any one of those, I would begin getting chills to the point where I couldn't stop shaking. Uh, as mentioned, I did have some pain. Um, it was in my right rib cage area. Uh, they did make sure that it wasn't my liver or any of the organs that are in that area. Uh, the doctor de uh, determined that it was the lymph the, the cancer cells and the lymph nodes dying and then getting released from the lymph nodes uh, because it always happened about three days three to four days after my rituxan infusion so and that's part of what the rituxan did is the uh, it would kill the cell kill the the cancer cells and uh, then you know they would exit my body would get rid of them so that's what they decided that it was. So on top of the medicines I already mentioned that I was on, I was also taking uh, tramadol. Uh, another thing that I started having was extreme dizziness. Now the tramadol did contribute to that, but that's also one of the side effects of the abrutinib and the rituxan. So, uh, you know, I didn't want to really move a whole lot uh, because I, I couldn't walk because I was so dizzy, I couldn't see straight. Um, fatigue, uh, I did miss a lot of work. Now when I say fatigue, it's not only physical, but it's also mental. So something as simple as remembering a six digit number, or I should say five digit number, five digit number that gets used multiple times a day, I could not remember it. So I'd write it down. Then I couldn't remember where I wrote it down at. So I had to, I was really struggling at work when I did make it to work 
um, because I was so mentally and physically fatigued, it was very difficult to function. Okay, and oh, the other symptom or side effect that I did begin experiencing, and this is from the abrutinib, is a lot of muscle pain and cramps, uh, muscle spasms. Okay, so let's see, my last rituxan infusion was uh, August of 2015. And so I did give a chance, and then once the rituxan ended, uh, I, w I pretty much was pain free. So if I took the tramadol, it was only on an occasion, maybe once, once a week, twice a week, uh, when it, the bit, you know, pain. But uh, you know, when the pain did flare up, I did take, you know, one to two a week. The dizziness did not subside, and so um, I was walking up the the, the best stairs to my back porch. Um, there's a railing only on one side, and so I actually got so dizzy that I fell off those stairs. I didn't get hurt except for you know a little scrape and a little bruise but it was at that point then the doctor decided okay this is too much so he did reduce my dose of the abrutinib to two pills a day. So you might be asking how am I? How is the medicine working? Well since ending the rituxan in August of 2015 and a couple months later reducing the abrutinib to two pills. I have been taking two pills a day every day ever since. And the good news that I received through another bone marrow biopsy and CT scan is that my white blood cell count is normal. Yay! It took about 18 months for it to stay there. Um, I had a couple that there was, you know, normal or close to normal, and it would go back up. But it finally uh, did go down to normal, and it's been staying normal for about the last year, or six six months to a year. Um, I did have the bone marrow biopsy and a CT scan at 12 months after I began treatment and the bone marrow biopsy. There was no leukemia in my bone marrow. There was none in my large or major lymph nodes. There was just a little bit of leukemia left in my smaller lymph nodes. So that means that the medicine was working very well. Um, that was February of last year. Uh, I have not had a bone marrow biopsy or a CT scan since. And I don't expect to get one as long as my uh, cell or blood cell counts remain normal. Um, that also means that um, not only was my white blood cell count normal, but another measurement is the actual lymphocyte count. Uh, it was, of course, elevated with the leukemia. It is now also normal. The lingering side effects that I have is I do still have the mental and physical fatigue. I'll be uh, see, <laughs> and this this is an example. Uh, I'll be trying to think of, of what I want to say, and it'll just be gone. And so I'll be in the middle of a sent. I'll even be in the middle of a sentence, and what I was saying and my point that I was trying to make it'll just, it'll be gone. And it takes, sometimes it returns, and sometimes it doesn't. It, it usually does return, but sometimes it's, you know, a couple hours later. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's what I was trying to say. And by physical fatigue, yesterday was a really bad day. I just, every time I tried to even lift my arm, something as, as simple as lifting your arm is very, very difficult. It just feels like you have weights on every single muscle of your body and you weigh a thousand pounds. It just makes it very difficult to move and 
when I get that way, unfortunately, the only thing I can do is rest. Uh, the muscle cramps and spasms, I still have those. Uh, I do take magnesium every day. That has helped tremendously. I also need to make sure that I remain well hydrated. And when I say well hydrated, I mean in excess of 100, 120 ounces of fluids a day. You know, the eight, standard eight glasses, 10 glasses of water, not enough. I have also been experienced uh, some chronic chest pain. We're still trying to determine exactly what's causing that, um, but the cardiologist has pretty much ruled out my heart, so that's a good thing. Um, the pulmonologist has ruled out my lungs, so um, we're just trying to figure out you know what exactly is causing that still. Uh, I have become uh, iron deficient anemic and I don't know if you can see um, I bumped my arm cut my arm right here you know scraped it and usually a scrapes no big deal you know you just get a little scrape but let's see if I can see it you can't really see it right here as you can see it's really bruised um, it's almost healed, so you, it's not as, as prominent as it was, but but that's, you know, a big side effect of the medication uh, is bruising. Uh, one of my, in my unboxing, my Instant Pot video, one of my viewers noticed the big bruise on my arm. It doesn't hurt. They just up here, and it's a side effect of the medicine. Usually, when I get blood take drawn, which happens every three months, <laughs> uh, that's protocol of the clinical trial. But usually, when I get blood drawn, I you know get a big bruise all the way around uh, around it. Um, as I mentioned, there's bruising. Uh, you know, I'll be working on the computer, my arm will start bruising just from using the mouse. I'll be doing dishes, leaning over the sink, and I'll get bruises on my belly. Uh, just from that. Um, now along with the bruising, I am at a risk for bleeding. Uh, so last week I did have some medical procedures done, and because of the risk of bleeding, I had to stop my medicine for five days before and five days after the procedure. and. I think because of that, I didn't get bruised from the IV. I think that's why. Uh, I still do have the occasional chills. Uh, I still do alternate between diarrhea and constipation. Uh, one thing I did do to help that, and I think it has helped, or try and help that, is uh, I was taking my medication in the morning and the doctor suggested taking it in the evening so I've been taking the evening and it's seemed so far to help somewhat um, and as I mentioned I am at a risk for dehydration so 100 to 120 ounces minimum every day of fluids uh, the other things that I am at risk of um, is tumor lysis syndrome and that's where the dead cancer cells build up in your body and your body can't get rid of them. I'm not so much of a risk um, for it now because I don't have the leukemia cells. Um, the way the medicine works is it helps prevent the development of the, of the cells, of the cancer cells. But when I first did begin treatment that was a, a big risk. I'm also at risk for AFib arterial fibrillation and that's one reason when I was having the chest pains why the doctor first wanted to rule out uh, the heart and then the big one with this medication I got a phone call from the research assistant a couple a couple months ago and said that the FDA did add a new high-risk side effect or potential risk with the medicine and she said she had to call me and tell me because something like that could determine or make 
me decide not to be on the study anymore and she wanted to make sure I wanted to remain on the study. Uh, she didn't know any of the details as far as why this was added to uh, the risk of po the potential risks of side effects. Um, but it unfortunately is death. <laughs> but, you know, obviously the doctor feels that the benefits of the medication far far outweigh the risk of potential death and at this point I have decided to remain on the study. I know this is kind of a long video but I did want to share that with you as I said because it is such a big part of my life and because of the chronic fatigue and the pain that I still experience on occasion uh, I may not be able to get videos out as regularly as I would like but I also want to have a way to chronicle what I'm going through, but also hope that by sharing what I'm experiencing, it will help others who might be dealing with the same disease or even any kind of cancer. Uh, I do participate once a week in a cancer support group um, and one thing that I have learned is that it doesn't really matter what kind of cancer you have many of the side effects of treatment that you experience but also many of the symptoms that you encounter are the same no matter what treatment you go through or what kind of cancer you have. Well I hope that you uh, like this video Please comment and subscribe and until next time you have a great day.